How many of you believe that preparation is important? Let me see your hand. You, preparation, you believe that it's important. How many of you enjoy the process of preparation? Some of you do, some of you don't. I never was crazy about the process. The culture that we live in today uh, has, I think, all but done away with the need of preparation. Everything has gone instant. And instant is not always better. Now, I, I like my instant cell phone. I like my instant internet. There's some things that's instant I think is good. But how many of you like instant potatoes over real potatoes? Well, there's one or two, but uh, the rest of us would prefer the real thing. I know that I would. I can remember, and I'm old enough to remember this. I can remember. Now, some of you are not going to know what I'm talking about. I can remember home-cooked meals. Isn't that amazing? I'm old enough to remember home-cooked meals. Do you remember home-cooked meals? <laughs> now we live off of fast food. Everything is fast. And then if it's not fast, we get upset because it's not fast enough. There was a time when people would wait all day long for a stagecoach, and now we get upset when the elevator's late. It's amazing. It, is preparation really important? Well... In some cases, I think that it really is. Now, if a doctor is going to perform surgery on me, I would prefer that doctor to be prepared, would you? I would like for them to go to school, ever how long they go to school, and really be prepared. And I don't want to be the first person that he has surgery on. I've often thought about that. Can you imagine the doctor coming into the um, surgery waiting room? Maybe we should ask Dr. Dixie about this. And all of a sudden, they announce, you're my first one. I'm out of here. <laughs> you know, I don't think so. But preparation is important. Um, I think about marriage, for example. We heard a little bit about that earlier. Um, a lot of young ladies will spend um, months, months preparing for this special day, that special event, that wedding but hardly no preparation for the marriage. One of the reasons why we have Marriage 101 on our website, it's a very important curriculum because we want people to be prepared. Um, we want to prepare children for life, and that's pretty tough at times. And we could just go on and on and on about talking about preparation is really important. I think it's the key to success for just about everything that you will do in life. I can remember when we started LifeBridge a little over four years ago. I want you to understand there was a lot of preparation before we ever started actually LifeBridge itself. And then when we started LifeBridge and we started having Bible studies, again, a lot of preparation Matter of fact, I think some of that group there at the beginning would get a little bit upset with me because I would say, I don't want you inviting anyone to worship yet. And they'd look at me like I was about crazy. We wasn't ready for it. There's two things you've got to do well before you really do worship well, and that's child care and music, and we wasn't ready for either one. Our first Public worship service was when we met at the University of Clear Lake, but so much preparation was made. And I think the reason why so many new churches fail today because there is no preparation. None whatsoever. Now, the same is true spiritually. Unless you're prepared for what God has next for you in life, you're probably not going to experience God's victory, the victory that he has for you. The difference in being prepared for the spiritual things is this, and this is a big difference. You don't always know what God has planned. We can talk about pre-January 1st of this year. Two churches really did not know what God had planned 
All we knew that we was praying to him and asking him to take care of it. But we really didn't know what he had planned. And then now we look at what he had planned. And I'll say this about both churches. And I really believe this is a very true statement. Both churches was ready to receive whatever God had prepared. Amen? Amen. No matter what it was. And I think that's the, the big, big difference. Now let's bring this home. Let's focus in on how preparation will help us to prepare for what God has planned for our life. I think, I know this. Every one of us, God has a unique plan for our life. Do you believe that? Amen. Very unique, one of a kind plan for your personal life. The question, and this is what the message is going to be about today, are you making preparations to receive what God has planned for your life? And there's a lot of things that you must do in that preparation. Now, I guess if I was to ask Jeb right now, Jeb, was you, a few days ago, was you prepared to do your memorial service for your father? He would probably say no. But this man had been preparing for this for years. Just wasn't, didn't know. Didn't know exactly what God had in mind. And we spoke earlier this morning. The Holy Spirit put it all together. We just must be open to whatever he has planned for our life. I want you to turn with me to the book of Joshua. And we'll stay there for the rest of the message. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and the next book is Gen uh, Joshua. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, then Joshua. So it's way back there, the very front of the Bible. I want us to look together at a very, I think, important lesson on preparation. Now, this message is going to be for everybody. And if you really pay close attention, you're going to get something out of it that probably nobody else will get out of it. Because I believe this is a type message. It's kind of like a 12-gauge a, a, a shotgun. It's just going to splatter all of us. And each of us will probably receive something a little bit different in this message. But it's a very, very, very important message. Matter of fact, I've had a lot of struggling uh, with this message all week and even this morning. In Joshua chapter 6, it talks about the conquering of Jericho. And this was going to be a huge challenge for God's people. Truth of the matter is, they themselves really was not prepared to meet this big challenge. Somebody was going to have to step in and help them. The people of God had to conquer Jericho or they would never be, be able to go where God wanted them to be. There are some challenges in your life that must be conquered. And you may have a challenge tomorrow that you don't know anything about. But I want you to know that God has already seen it. He's already working out the details and he's already preparing you to face it and to, to become victorious over it. But you've just got to pay attention. I mean pay close attention to what God has in mind. Look at verse 1 of, of Joshua chapter 6. Verse 1. Now Jericho was securely shut up because of the children of Israel. They had heard about these people. None went out and none came in. I mean they were securely secure in that city. Jericho had a gigantic wall all the way around the city. Probably the biggest wall that you'd ever seen in your entire life. The best that we can calculate and the best that we can understand, it was 25 feet high and 25 feet wide. Now, folk, that's a big wall. They were secure. They were thinking there's no way that anybody could ever conquer us. No one can conquer us. On top of that wall, it was so wide that all of the, the military could get up there and march around. And they could see for miles and miles and miles. And they knew exactly what was going on on the outside of the city. It was very, very secure. But I want you to notice verse 2. Verse 2. And the Lord said to Joshua... 
C. I love that word C. C, explanation mark. C, I have given Jericho into your hand. It's king and it's mighty men of valor. That, may, that word, word means mighty men of great strength. God says, I have given this city to you. That word have there is a very important verse, a word in that verse. It's a verb that is in past tense. And any time you see the word, at least this particular Hebrew word, have is not always this word, but this particular Hebrew word right here, it always means that it is a done deal. He says, I have given. That means it's already done. I have given this city to you. It's an action that's in the past, and the result is going to be for the present and for the future. It's already done. If I had a $100 bill, and if I was to say to, to Eddie, Eddie, here is a $100 bill, and after the service, you just come and get it. It is yours. It's a done deal. All he's got to do is just come and get it. It's not going to happen. Um, God says, I have given this city to you. Folk, there are so many victories that God has already given to you. It hasn't happened yet, but it is a done deal. No matter what you're struggling with, not, no matter what issue you are struggling with, life can be very difficult at times, and we have a lot of things that we have to deal with. If you're dealing here with, for, exa for example, addictive behaviors, God is ready to give you the victory. He's already given you the victory. You just got to be prepared for it. And do your part to receive it. Maybe you're this morning here and you're really facing some major, major challenges in relationship. That relationship that you're struggling over. God has already given you the victory. Romans 8.28 says it is going to work out to your best. Now, it may not work out the way that you want it to work out. Sometimes we just have to face that fact, do we not? But the victory is yours. God's already given it. Now then, look at verse 3. Verse 3. He gives them the instructions that they will need in order to win the victory. You shall march around the city, all you men of war. You shall go around this, the city once. This you shall do six days. Now, wait a minute. Seems kind of ridiculous. A good military strategy would have done it differently. A good military strategy would have said, well, let's just build some big old ramps, maybe a hundred of them, maybe 200 ramps, and we'll sneak up on them at night, and we'll put these ramps up on that wall, and we'll just sneak in there and just beat them into surrender. But that wasn't God's plan. God's plan was simply to march around the city. Sometimes we begin to think that we have a better plan than what God has. You may think it's better, but I'm telling you, it's not. God's plan to you sometimes may not make any sense whatsoever, but it's the best. And the truth of the matter is, it will always work the best as well. If you just simply begin to figure out what is God's plan for my life and do it exactly the way that He lays it out. Let's read a little bit further. Verse 3 says they were to march around the city one time each day for six days. Verse 4, And the seven priests shall bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark. But the seventh day, listen to this, the seventh day you shall march around the city seven times. 
and the priest shall blow the trumpets. It shall come to pass when they make a loud blast with the ram's horn, and when you hear the sound of the trumpet, that all the people shall shout with a, with a great shout. Then the wall of the city will fall down flat, and the people shall go up every man straight before him. Wow. What a plan. What a plan. Now jump all the way down to verse 10. I want to show you something pretty interesting here. Now Joshua had commanded the people saying, You shall not shout or make any noise with your voice, nor shall a word proceed out of your mouth until the day I say to you, Shout! Then you shall shout. The first thing I want you to notice here to be to be prepared for what God has next, you must keep silent. Be quiet. Now, what God is telling Joshua to do here, I think, is extremely interesting. He says, I want, these, I want the army, the, the men... By the way, you might notice this may be the reason why God didn't want the women to go with the men. Because you had to be completely quiet. <laughs> you had to be completely quiet. By the way, did you know that according to, according to how some people interpret Revelation chapter 8 and verse 1. Don't jump over there. You can read it when you get home. But according to Revelation chapter 8 verse 1, some people interpret that and they actually say that there will be no women in heaven. Because you'd have to be quiet for 30 minutes. Read it later. I'm telling you. It says, it, it, Revelation chapter 8, verse 1. Some people interpret it that way. I don't interpret it that way. Surely not. Not at all. But verse 10 says, For six days they were not to speak a single word while they was marching around the city. Now, folks, this is going to be a difficult thing to do. Think about it for just a few minutes. We love to talk. We enjoy talking. We enjoy talking better than we enjoy listening. And we love to talk. But just picture now, these people, I don't know how many men it was. And here they are, they're going to march around this city. One of the first things that you would want to do is talk about what you're doing. You know, I don't quite understand this. Why? I think Joshua's gone off his rocker. I can just hear the conversation that they would want to talk about. Joshua is crazy. We need to get us another leader. March around this city every day for six days. What is he thinking? But they went, maybe that was the reason God said, don't let them say a word. Don't even let them whisper. I don't want them to say one single word for six days as they marched around this city. Folk, being silent before God is a very valuable lesson that you and I need to learn. We really do. I really encourage you this morning to work on this. It is an important part of your devotional time. Just find you a wonderful place that you pray. And you can pour your heart out to God and you can talk to Him about your petitions. But I encourage you to spend some time just in silence to listen. And God will say some interesting things to you some things that you're not even thinking about whatsoever if you will just be silent and just listen for a little while this is something that God's people really have a lot of problems with a lot of problems just being silent I encourage you to try this on a daily basis I tell you what let's just pause here for just a moment for just a few seconds Let's just completely be silent. And let's just listen. Listen to the Spirit of God. If you want to close your eyes for just a moment, you can. Let's just be completely silent and listen.
I don't know if God spoke to you or not. He may have said something to you that you've never even thought about him saying at all. I just want you to know that he wants to. Now then, let's jump all the way down to verse 11. Verse 11, and I want you to see here that the next thing is we need to prepare what God has next for us by obeying. Look at verse 11. So uh, it says, So he had the ark of the Lord circle the city, going around it once. Then they came into the camp and lodged in the camp. And Joshua rose up early in the morning, and the priests took up the ark of the Lord. Then seven priests bearing seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark of the Lord went on continually and blew the trumpets, and the army, and the armed men went before him, but the rear guard came after the ark of the Lord while the priest continually blowing the trumpets. And the second day they marched around the city once and returned to the camp. And so they did this for six days. But it came to pass on the seventh day that they rose early and the dawn of the day and marched around the city seven times in the same manner. And on that day only they marched around the city seven times. Every day. Now, I don't know how large Jericho was, but let's just say it was a decent-sized city. Wow, it would take a while to march around that city in complete silence. Can you imagine the mockery that, that they probably could hear in the distance of the military guard on top of the wall trying to figure out, what are those stupid people doing down there? They're just marching around the city. And the next day they would do it again. And the next day they would do it again. And the next day they would do it again. And the next day they would do it again. Do you believe that obedience is, a very, is an important part of receiving God's blessings? Amen. You think it's a must? I believe obedience is extremely important because it does honor God. Now sometimes we don't understand why God is asking us to do something. But listen to me. You don't have to understand it. There's been many times in my life that I really did not understand why God was leading me to do a certain thing. That's called faith. Just believing that it's better. Matter of fact, the Bible says in 1 Samuel chapter 15, to obey is better than sacrifice. Would you agree with this statement? Obedience is proof that you trust God. You see, I believe that I don't know if there's anything that pleases God more than obedience. You say, well, what about faith? If you really believed, would you not do? If you really believed, would you not fulfill that what you believed and do what God was asking you to do? I believe we would. Now notice verse 20. Notice verse 20. We see the third step. In preparing for the people to conquer Jericho. Verse 20. So the people shouted when the priest threw the trumpets. It happened when the people heard the sound of the trumpet. And the people shouted with a great shout. That the wall fell down flat. Then the people went up into the city. Every man straight before him. And they took the city. My friend, the third step that I wanted you to see this morning is simply obeying to the end. What if they would have marched around the city maybe on day one or day two and then quit? What if they went ahead and marched around the city on day three and day four and day five and then quit? What if they would have went out there for six days and marched around that city once and did exactly what God asked them to do for six straight days? And then at the end of that day said, nothing's going to happen, I just quit. They would have never experienced victory. Do you believe that many times we quit just shy of victory? It's hard sometimes to be obedient in whatever God is asking you to be obedient in. Maybe, it, as I mentioned earlier, you're struggling with something. And, it, 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 and you're doing well. And, 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 and week one, you're doing 
okay, but it's hard. And week two is still hard. And week three is still hard. And you just keep on and keep on. And finally you say, I just quit. Victory will never come. My friend, you must obey to the end in order to enjoy the victory that God wants to give. On the seventh day, I don't, that had to be an extremely long day. How many times did they march around on the seventh day? How many? Seven times. Now, they'd already marched around that city six times. Once every day for six days. Now, on the seventh day, Joshua, are you crazy? What do you want us to do? I think you've got your instructions wrong from God. I can just hear it. That must have not been a bunch of Baptists back then. Must have not been. <laughs> Joshua, you mean seven times? But what happened when they obeyed to the end? Amen. Do you get, do you get the message here this morning? Amen. What happened when they obeyed to the very end? It may have looked totally ridiculous. It look, may have looked totally crazy. But victory came. I want to give you another example uh, over in 2 Kings. I'm not going to turn over there, but uh, it, it talks about a Syrian general named Naaman. Uh, he was told by the, he, he had leprosy. And um, he was told by the prophet Elisha that um, his leprosy would be cured if he would go to the Jordan River and bathed himself seven times. Now, at the very beginning, Naaman got very mad. Naaman said, I'm not going to do that. That's ridiculous. I'm not going to do that. And then he thought about it a little bit more. See, he was hoping God would tell him to do something really great. I mean, really spectacular. What is it you really want me to do, God? The prophet said, just go down to the Jordan River and bathe yourself seven times and you will be cured. So he went. Didn't understand it. Now, I don't know about this, but I have a strong feeling maybe half-heartedly believed it. But he believed it just enough to do it. Do you think sometimes God would bless that? You remember the guy that wanted his son, son healed, and Jesus said, do you believe? And the guy said, I believe, but help me with my unbelief. You remember that? And do you remember what Jesus said to the guy? To the father, he said, that's enough. I'll heal your son. Oh, Naaman goes down there and he bathes himself one time, then two times, then three times. He's probably looking around, seeing if anybody's looking. And then kept on and kept on. And wow, what happened on the seventh time? The scripture says this. I think I wrote it down. It says he was restored and he became clean like a young boy. Wow. He obeyed to the end. I know it's hard sometimes. Marriage relationships sometimes fail because people will not obey the oath that they took to each other till death do us part and we want to give up. I think giving up is too easy today. Amen. Way, way too easy. I can remember a time when, when divorce was difficult to get. I don't think it's difficult to get it now. Just, just get you a lawyer, pay him a few bucks, and you got it. Too many people give up too soon, just shy of the victory. Oh, how we need to learn the importance of what we looked at here today. Victory does come as a result of obeying to the end. Yes, faith is the victory. But obedience is really the result of true faith. True faith. I've made a commitment to God, and I made this a long time ago, and I have to renew it quite frequently. God, I'll be faithful to the end. Faithful to the end. I have no idea how many more years I have, and I don't mind telling you, your pastor gets tired at times very tired. I was up this morning at 
working on this stuff. And you say, well, why? I don't know. I don't know. Had some other things to do. I'm going to be leaving town just right after service to go see my nephew. I want you to pray for Jeff. I mentioned him a couple of weeks ago. Um, he's not doing well, so I just need to take off and go down and see him. He's dying. And I hadn't seen him in years. And uh, had some other things to do. It's hard. I don't mind telling you. But I made a commitment. And God reminds me of that commitment to stay faithful to the end. Here at Life Bridge, we've already seen a lot of victories as, as a result of being faithful. Amen. I think about Vacation Bible School. <laughs> Those of you that worked in Vacation Bible School, was it easy? Piece of cake, huh? Yeah, right. It's difficult. Very difficult. I don't know how many hours and hundreds of hours that some of you put into it. Barbara and Teresa and some of the others. Man, it was hard. But you stayed committed to the end. And what happened? What happened? Maybe at the beginning we thought, I'm a little bit discouraged. We don't have 500 kids. I was saying, I'm glad God didn't send us 500 kids. No, I shouldn't say that. <laughs> but the, kid, the children that we had all benefited from the faithfulness of the workers. Amen? Amen? Truth of the matter is, the workers benefited probably more than the children did. Right? Faithful to the end. I can think about youth camps. Two youth camps next to each other. First you got the children. You had the easy one first. And then you had the teens, right? Yeah, that's right. Well, I, I think about Celebrate Recovery. It's hard. But we have people that show up every Tuesday night. And we've made a commitment that we will be there every Tuesday night. Rain, shine, snow, ice, holiday. It makes no difference. And we've already seen victories. Last two weeks we've had over 50. Just on Tuesday nights. In Celebrate Recovery. We run way more than most churches. That have Celebrate Recovery already. And I believe it's because of the faithfulness of the people. I think about our life groups. On Wednesday night. I've been in the ministry now for 30. Over 35 years. And I'm not just saying this. Just to be saying it. It is a fact. We have the best life groups that I've ever experienced on Wednesday night. Amen. It is truly, truly amazing. The things that are discussed, the, the spiritual growth. Those of you that are, that are coming to the Wednesday night life groups, are you growing? Yes. Is God speaking to you? Yes. Is it amazing here in the teen, back yonder in the other children, back in the fellowship hall, you know? We are growing, and it's because of the commitment that people are, made, are making to obey to the end. Now, I, I wish all of you would do this, but I understand that some of you will not. Even when we started January 1st, I noticed a few are beginning to slack off. And it breaks my heart. Ah, oh, we can justify it. I don't like this, and I don't like the way Brandon combs his hair. Or I don't like this, and I, I don't like the way this is happening. I don't like the way that is happening. What difference does it make if God has been glorified, if people have been reached? What difference does it make? Amen. If right. He has been glorified, and God is being reached it's always about him and them too many of us want to make it about me I've made a commitment to be faithful to the end I ask that you continue to pray for me that I never fall short of that now it's your time have you made a commitment to be faithful the first thing you need to do as a creation of God is accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. Amen. Amen. And once you do that, you need to be faithful to the other things that a child of God should be faithful. Scriptural baptism is extremely important. Church membership is extremely important. Faithfulness to church services is extremely important. Faithfulness to live like Jesus Christ is extremely important. I invite you this morning to renew the commitment that you have to God. Sometimes it's important. Sometimes we, uh, somebody asked me not long ago, and they already gave me the date. I don't remember what the date is. I hope they remind me again. 
about renewing their wedding vows. They just, you know, why in the world would anybody want to do it, the two, do it two times? Renew your wedding vows to the same person that you already said it to is a recommitment. Annually at Life Parish, and we'll do this in January, we have an annual recommitment of all the membership of Life Bridge. Is it important? Recommitments are very important. I invite you this morning to experience the victory that sometimes, listen, is totally impossible, humanly speaking. Do you think it was possible for the children of Israel to do what God did for them in conquering Jericho? It wasn't possible. But they was committed and God gave them the victory. Stand with me and let's pray. Father, dear Lord, I pray for every man, every woman, every teen, everyone in this service here today. God, I just pray for a commitment from each one. First, through salvation and second, through obedience. Lord, whatever you are leading anyone here today to do this morning, I pray right now they would be willing to do whatever that is. Whatever it is. Father, I pray for a commitment. Because God, I know victory is coming in that person's life that is willing to be committed to the end. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Listen to the words. I invite you to respond. The song is I Surrender All. Have you ever done that? Have you really ever truly surrendered all? Everything to you. To Jesus I surrender. I surrender. To him I feel
Father, we do surrender all. I thank you for those that are here at the altar committing their lives to you. I thank you, Father, for those that are here and joining in praying for each other that nothing would happen to, to interrupt this commitment. Father, I especially pray for Brandon and Julie. God, I love this couple. You've begun, began a great thing, God. I thank you for them having a desire to come together as one, as partners, to minister and to reach teens and adults and to change lives. Father, I know the devil's not happy about this. But I also know you're greater than he is. When struggles come, remind them who's with them. I pray for each other, one that's here today, that's even in the pew, that's making a commitment to surrender all. Help us, Father, to be willing to obey all the way to the end. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.